Welcome to my recap of Castlevania Season 4. If you're interested in a particular episode, use the chapter markers in the description. Otherwise, grab a mug of Belmont's favorite brew and enjoy the recap. In the weeks following their departure from Lindenfeld, Trevor and Sypha continue their travels, killing night creatures and other foes as needed. Throughout their encounters, they learn two disturbing facts. One, various groups are attempting to resurrect Dracula, attempts Sypha and Trevor have been able to stop so far. And two, since meeting Trevor, Sypha has transformed from a nice person to the kind of person who curses. But you never, you know, curse. They never used to, and then all this happened, and then you happened. At one of these encounters, they find a statue depicting the Grim Reaper, or Death. Belmont explains that it is not actually Death, although he was given that name by people long ago. There are elemental beings that just feed on things in nature. He's not Death, Belmont says. He just eats Death. That statue was likely put up by people believing the being to actually be Death. They hoped to pay tribute so he could bring Dracula back to them. Though, Trevor points out, while this being is lethal, he would not have the ability to pull someone out of hell. In front of the statue, they notice a slab of flagstone. Trevor surmises it must have come from a town square, the nearest of which would be Targovista, the place where Dracula's wife was burned at the stake. A place where, one week later, an exhausted Trevor and Sypha kill two vampires snooping around an armory. After the battle, they wonder what the monsters were looking for, and among the many weapons around them, Trevor picks up a dagger. It stinks of magic. The vampires were looking for tools. As they leave, Trevor comments, I don't get it. We killed Dracula. And now, we have to spend the rest of our lives making sure nobody brings him back from the dead. In a nearby tower, two vampires, Varney and Ratko, spy from a distance and notice the Belmont and Speaker Magician leaving the building. They also notice the two vampires they sent into it did not come out. Varney, dressed in old ragged clothes, complains that it's not fair. He was one of Dracula's first loyal followers. Dracula was going to give him everything, but now he has to deal with a Belmont and a mad magician? Varney was going to take Targovista and give it to Dracula as a gift, but everyone is making it so hard for him. Don't they know who I am? Varney asks. No, Radko responds. At his castle, a grimy and tired Alucard walks into his courtyard, now decorated with corpses on sticks. A horse approaches him, carrying a dead man on its back. The rider died on the journey, but the horse went on, bringing him to their destination. Alucard finds a small note tied to the man's hand. In it, the people of a nearby town, Dynesti, beg for his help in fending off the assault of night creatures, vampires, and demons. Please, sir. Save our souls, the note concludes. As the sun goes down, Alucard buries the man and feeds the horse. Back in his castle, he stares into the mirror at his bored face covered in dirt and says, Oh my god, I'm turning into Belmont. In Carmilla's castle, Hector wanders freely and when no one is watching, places runes into various cracks in the walls. In his study, he gathers some documents and uses a distance mirror to send Varney a message. He has learned more about what it'll take to resurrect Dracula. They need to identify the exact spot where Dracula was killed. And there is evidence of a transmission mirror in the possession of the court at Targovista. Later, Lenore visits Hector as she has nothing better to do. He can tell something is wrong and observes that Lenore fears she's being sidelined. As she points out, her strong suit is diplomacy, and it seems that there is no longer a need for it. She also points out that Although she is a child of war, she will never be comfortable with the idea that the best way to end war is to kill most of the people and cage the rest. Then she changes topics to the hammer Hector has been working on. He needs it to forge Carmilla's army of night creatures. After playfully comparing the hammer to a certain appendage of Hector's, she warns that Carmilla is growing impatient with how long it's taking Hector to build it. However, she'll protect him from Carmilla as long as she can. Then she visits Carmilla, who whimsically thinks aloud she would have liked to have Dracula's castle. You already have a nice castle. Why would you want his? Lenore asks. Because I take things away from stupid, evil old men, 
Carmilla says. It's what I do. I've always done it. They deserve to lose everything and I deserve to have all their stuff. Then she points at the map of lands ruled by stupid old men. Lands where the regional vampires have been killed. Lands she can rule. We could take the entire world for our own, Carmilla says. Lenore insistently asks if that will make her happy. Carmilla responds that the first part of her life was men taking things from her. Then she took their lives, things, and homes. Then they took Styria and tried to make a home, but they were attacked from all sides. And when we asked for help, Carmilla says, what did the rest of the vampire world say? Bloody women, they said. Let them die, they said. Carmilla's eyes bulge as she adds, so I'm going to take everything from everybody. She tears down her curtains, waves her hand at the lands outside, and tells Lenore she will take the world for herself. Will I be happy when I've done that? She asks. I don't know. I don't know if I even care. But I will have everything that they had, and they will all be dead. I will have the world I want, Lenore. And that, that will be enough. In Targovishta, Trevor and Saifa find a barn to sleep in. But their peace is quickly interrupted by the arrival of Varney and Ratko, joined by a small group of night creatures. Surrounded, Trevor and Saifa battle the monsters, while the two vampires watch from above. Soon, they are joined by uniformed guards from Targovishta's court. With their help, Trevor and Saifa dispatch the creatures, though only one of their newfound allies survives, Zamfir, head guard to the underground court of Targovishta. She explains that, after Dracula's attack, the surviving members of the royal family were forced to take refuge in the catacombs under the city, protected from the monsters above. Zamfir shares that some vampires in the area hope to ransack the catacombs for its magical treasures, to help resurrect Dracula. Trevor and Saifa ask to see the courts, and Zamfir excitedly puts her hands on their shoulders, saying, We would be delighted to have you join the royal struggle. Well, good, Trevor says. Help us save Targovishta, Zamfir awkwardly adds. Gladly, Saifa says, but not yet. Zamfir continues, I cannot take you to the court until I am certain I can trust you. Then she notices Varney and Ratko flying off and runs out of the barn after them. Well, she was interesting, Sypha says. You mean a little crazy, Belmont offers. Then Trevor checks the bodies of the dead guards and finds a magical rune on one of them, which he stashes away. In the town which used to belong to a mad magician, Isaac enjoys a plate of berries under the bright sky while his night creatures rebuild the town around him. The fly-like creature that speaks approaches Isaac and asks what they are doing. Why does Isaac have them going against their nature by building instead of destroying? Isaac points out that their nature is fluid and insists the fly try a berry. As the creature tastes the fruit, his eyes grow wide. Memories, he says. Finally, Isaac answers his question. They will rebuild the town and leave so others may find it and make homes of it. Hammers, he explains, can be used to crack skulls or build, just as night creatures can be used as tools for destruction or creation. Or perhaps Isaac will recognize they are not tools at all. For no tool would taste a berry and remember the time in its first life when it encountered them, Isaac says. In the magician's tower, Isaac reflects on the last few weeks he spent rebuilding the town. He speaks to the statue of the old wizard, saying he's killed many people. But killing you, Isaac says, felt just. It felt like repairing the world a little. I liked that feeling. Isaac no longer wants to be a knife wielded by others. He wants to be the hand. After a life of merely reacting to things, he wants to have agency and create futures. Elsewhere, Striga and Morana rest at their camp after a long night of travels. In the quiet of day, Morana shares that she is worried. Seeing the theater of combat up close, she realizes that there is no swift and merciful way for them to take all the land Carmilla wants. The humans will suffer, and it will never stop because the vampires will have to fight the same war over and over, always keeping the rebellious humans down. Back home, it all made sense because Carmilla has a way of getting them to buy into her plans and dreams. But out here, when it's just the two of them, things are clearer. 
They're interrupted by an arrow fired through their tent, letting in a ray of deadly sunlight. Striga quickly insists Miranda protect herself in a coffin while she dons her day armor. With the metal suit protecting her from sunlight and arrows, Striga easily slaughters the humans hoping to drive them out. Striga returns to Miranda in the tent. They weren't fighters, Striga says. They were just people, villagers, farmers and the like. She saw the fear in their eyes, not fear of dying, but the fear of not having fought to save their people. They knew the battle was hopeless, but they fought it anyway. We'd never stop, would we? Striga asks, then pontificates on Carmula's war. Victory condition is just fighting and holding the whole insane structure of her empire together until I die of old age. They realize the war would separate them, with Striga out in the field, always fighting, and Marana and Styria handling logistics. They hold each other, and in the cold light of day ask if that's what they really want. They're interrupted by a message from Carmilla, sent by Distance Mirror. Sisters, she says, Hector is finally ready to start making night creatures. Come home. It begins. In Targovista, Trevor and Sypha tour the town. They see starving people and disease-ridden corpses left out in the open. They wonder why the town is still infested with vampires and night creatures. What's their end game? Everything led the two of them here. Trevor wonders how they fit into this. The word fit triggers a thought. He takes out the dead guard's gem and fits it into the dagger he found, causing it to glow with magic. Trevor suggests they find somewhere quiet to be alone. In an abandoned home, he points out that for weeks all they've been doing is reacting, and they do best when they have time to sit and think. It's time to stop reacting and start acting. In the town of Dynasty, villagers nervously prepare to fend off the nightly visit of demons and night creatures. As monsters break through the town's fences, Alucard races in on horseback. With a shield and a floating sword, he slays the beasts. Then he meets Greta, the village headwoman who sent him the letter. He lets her know that the rider who carried it died on the voyage. They've lost a third of their village, Greta explains, as they've been under attack for four days. Will you help us, she asks, and makes it clear it'll take more than just one fight and some magic tricks. Will you stay and defend them for as long as it takes, she asks more firmly. Alucard says he will, but she continues, pointing out he lives in a castle with bodies on sticks. He's half vampire and appears to be at least half crazy. But you were the only possible advantage I could think of, she adds. I need you to commit to saving these people, because my life isn't worth living if I can't save theirs. All done. Did it work? Yes, Alucard replies. Then she thanks him and adds that he had one hell of an entrance. From a nearby latrine, St. Germain voices his agreement. Then he opens the door and continues, Sickening violence isn't especially in my skill set, you understand, but I can recognize a fellow expert, no matter what the field. Greta rolls her eyes, and St. Germain introduces himself to Alucard as a scholar in residence to many of the great courts of Europe. He is traveling to witness the turbulence in Wallachia. When Alucard flippantly asks if he's enjoying his tourism, St. Germain silently reflects on his recent experiences. He recalls introducing himself to various courts as an occultist, scribe, counsel, scholar, astrologist, or whatever profession he believes would most likely lead to their acceptance of his services. In his travels, a woman catches his eye. He notices a strange man reaching for an unwelcome advance on the woman, and St. Germain shouts a warning. She quickly breaks the man's finger, and after a few punches, leaves him barely moving on the floor. Bowing in glee, St. Germain introduces himself to her, saying, Swift violence is not my forte, but I certainly recognize and admire an expert. She smiles. They share stories of their travels. He mentions his quest to find the Infinite Corridor a route to other worlds, and she helps locate a book on the topic. Together, they journey through the portal, and he loses her in it. Later, St. Germain meets Trevor and Sypha before leaving them for another journey into the Infinite Corridor. He searches for the one he lost, and finds the strange world of spiraling bookshelves where he left her. But a strange woman, decorated with glowing symbols, informs St. Germain that his friend left for another sphere. 
The woman, an alchemist, explains that to find her, St. Germain will have to control the corridor, a feat he only witnessed once before, from a night creature that swallowed dozens of souls as fuel to accomplish the task. For St. Germain to do the same, he will have to pursue the ultimate goal of alchemy, the rebus, or the putrefied and purified fusion of matter and spirit, in a body both male and female. Specifically, the alchemist guides him to the conclusion that he must pull the souls of Dracula and his wife out of hell so they can be fused together in a rebus. She hands him a key that will open a portal wherever he chooses, and sends him on a journey, promising he'll have to sacrifice his ethics and morals along the way. You must give everything to it, she says, and you must cause pain in the doing of it. He sadly agrees he'll do anything for a chance to tell the one he lost that he loves her. And he does. He kills when men refuse to help. He uses threats to gather information. And he takes a call from Varney, who is delighted Saint Germain knows of him. According to Varney, they have a project in common, returning Dracula to the world. Although Varney's vampires hate taking instruction from a human, they need Saint Germain's knowledge and intelligence to enact the resurrection. So they follow his plan, which includes using night creatures and vampires to drive large swaths of villagers to Dynasty. A town where weeks later, Saint Germain stands with Greta and Alucard, keeping his prior knowledge of the attack on their town to himself. Then, Alucard hears something in the distance, and they find a group of villagers approaching. As per Saint Germain's plan, they are refugees from nearby towns ravaged by night creatures. Saint Germain points out that Dynasty is not a particularly safe place for them to stay. Instead, he suggests they all temporarily hold up in Alucard's castle. Alucard hates the idea, but also sees it's the right move. He reluctantly agrees to it. They begin their journey to the castle at night, as their enemy would expect them to wait for daylight. On their walk, Greta tells Alucard that she can smell magic on him and Saint Germain. On Alucard, it's a sweet smell, but on Saint Germain, it's rotten. At Carmilla's castle, Lenore watches in disgust as Hector raises night creatures. Once the two are left alone, Hector notices something is bothering Lenore. After some prodding, she admits that yes, she is worried. She opens up to Hector, and he listens, which she appreciates. This is why I like you. You're capable of actually listening to me. Then she tells him what's really bothering her. It's what Carmilla showed her. Maps. Not just maps of Europe, but the world. Worst of all, she kept her plan of world domination from Lenore. Carmilla lied to her, just like, as Hector points out, Dracula lied to him. Elsewhere, on their journey to the castle, Alucard and Greta lead the villagers in battle against night creatures stalking them on the road. In between bouts, Alucard tells Greta the story of Taka and Sumi. Greta sympathizes. Hmm, I can see that. I mean, I had a boyfriend and a girlfriend at the same time once, but they never tried to kill me. Actually, no, I tell a lie. His wife went for me with a pitchfork. They laugh. They encounter more night creatures, but are able to fight them off, with Alucard handling the most difficult of them. And eventually, as the sun rises, they reach the castle. Saint Germain marvels at it, while Greta just finds it to be cold and ugly. Alucard reminds her that she's talking about his childhood home. Well, that explains a lot, she says, but quickly adds, Sorry, some places just have a chill on them. Maybe my people and I can warm it up a little. Alucard bows and welcomes her to his home. He smiles. In Targovishta, Saifa tells Trevor she agrees with him. They've been reacting too much. It's time to plant their feet and just act. In their first act, should be to help the townsfolk remember things they've forgotten, to help them rise from the squalor they're living in. She yells at some nearby villagers, telling them not to put latrines so close to where they sleep and cook. They'll get sick. Then, Saifa gets mad when she sees Zamfir demanding food from starving citizens. The court needs it, Zamfir claims. Saifa stops her and explains that if they take the people's food, Zamfir's invisible king and queen will rule over nothing but bones. Also, Saifa can kill Zamfir just by looking at her. Finally, Zamfir cooperates, and Saifa begins organizing the villagers. 
First rule, Saifa explains, is make your shelter safe. She points out that the night creatures threatening their city are likely hiding out in abandoned buildings. She asks Zamfir to have some of her fighters investigate them and clear them out. Nearby, Trevor has a realization. If there's an underground court, it's likely located in some underground catacombs, and they must be composed of complex tunnels. Otherwise, vampires would have found them by now. And he has another realization. Vampires and night creatures are probably also using the tunnels. Trevor knocks on the ground, and a bat-like night creature answers, bursting out of it. The creature rushes at Zamfir, pins her to a wall, and quietly puts a magic needle through the back of her shirt. Sypha quickly tackles the monster and kills it. Elsewhere, Isaac activates his large transmission mirror and leads his army of night creatures through it to Carmilla's castle. They attack, killing every guard in sight, both human and vampire. As Isaac's monsters come for Carmilla, she defends herself, slaying any creature that comes close. And amidst the chaos, Lenore finds Hector. She begs him to follow her so she can bring him to safety. But instead, he summons a magical cage around her. Then, using a distance mirror, he places a call to Saint Germain, giving him some final instructions for the resurrection of Dracula. Lenore accuses him of having gone mad. I've been mad, Hector says. This doesn't feel like that. Maybe I've gone sane. Then Isaac enters the room. He approaches Lenore, until Hector demands Isaac leave her alone. If you're here to kill me, Hector says, kill me, but leave her alone. She is not the threat here. Isaac approaches Hector, who quickly surrenders, explaining he's taken the steps to ensure Dracula's return and atone for his betrayal. Then, Hector leans forward and tells Isaac to take his revenge. But he doesn't. Instead, Isaac says the two of them have been children. Revenge is for children. It's time to grow up. It's time for them to forge their own path. Isaac asks Hector to have his night creatures stand down, but he cannot. The slave ring transfers that power to Lenore and Carmilla's ruling council. Hector offers Isaac a magical device which will activate a path to Carmilla's study, an escape route Hector created in secret while wandering the castle. Hector encourages Isaac to kill Carmilla and stop her taking over the world. He just asks that Lenore remain safe. Lenore merely watches in horror from her cage. Then Hector borrows Isaac's knife and uses it to sever his own finger, thereby removing Carmilla's control over the night creatures, making them easier to pick off. Isaac magically ignites his dagger to cauterize the wound, then thanks Hector before leaving. He activates Hector's path. A tunnel forged of blue light appears before him and leads directly to Carmilla. The light surrounds her as well, trapping the vampire inside the tunnel. Isaac and his army kill any humans, vampires, or night creatures in their way as they charge toward Carmilla. By the time he reaches her, the room is bathed in a pool of blood, spilled from the many creatures slain by Carmilla in her fight to survive. Isaac approaches the exhausted vampire, who struggles to stand. She asks if he's come to kill her, and he replies, I think the world would be a better place without you, yes. You can't be trusted. I'd always fear you and your ambitions. So yes, I'm very much afraid I have to kill you. Blood splashes at their feet as the two rush into battle. An already exhausted Carmilla finds that fighting Isaac also means fighting more of his night creatures. Protected by the monsters, Isaac takes no damage while easily slashing Carmilla, drawing her blood into the growing pool below them. After repeated attacks, Carmilla is reduced to the stature of a caged animal. She is unable to fight, and instead can only face her executioners. Look at you all, she shouts. You're not big enough to kill me. You're nothing. You don't deserve my blood. And when you die and go to hell, she points at Isaac, I'll be there waiting for you, with a sharp bloody stick, and with the determination to find out if you can die twice. She raises her arms and continues, I'm Carmilla of Styria, and fuck you! Bloody tears flow from her red eye, and she quietly adds, I win, before impaling herself with a dagger. Isaac's night creatures protect him from the explosion of her death, an explosion which sends shockwaves over the land surrounding her castle, interrupting Striga and Mirana's approach. 
the two immediately feel that Carmilla is dead, and assume Lenora suffered the same fate. They discuss what to do next. Should they try to retake the castle, even though their odds are uncertain? Miranda suggests they instead head west and continue a life together without plans. Striga smiles and agrees. In the castle, Isaac visits Hector, who assumes they will now leave to aid in Dracula's resurrection. However, Isaac suggests they forget about it and instead move on. He eases Hector's guilt by pointing out that Hector was manipulated and had no agency in his betrayal of Dracula. Resurrecting the vampire would be an emotional decision, not a logical one. Let him sleep, Hector, Isaac says. We were both mistreated by the human world. We were both admirers of Dracula's intellect. We both saw something bigger than ourselves in him. We both wanted to see the world punished. We can do more than that. Dracula earned his rest. We can and should move forward. The two friends discuss the future as they're both thinking about for the first time. Hector will be left alone with Lenore, where he will read, write, and create. And Isaac will build something new, where people can live for a future. I'm going to live, Isaac says, and smiles. In their hideout, Ratko reveals to Varney that the tracker in Zamfir's collar worked. They can now locate Targovishta's underground court. Varney congratulates himself on the plan, which infuriates Ratko, who claims it was his plan. Ratko proclaims that he is done pretending Varney is anything more than just a criminal that somehow wormed his way into Dracula's circle over a hundred years ago. Radko is someone that fights wars and hates vampires like Varney that worry about being witty and being known. You do not know what I am, Varney says, but I tolerate you precisely because you are good at death. It nourishes me. At Alucard's castle, the villagers put up a small settlement leading from the courtyard into the interior of the castle. Inside, Saint Germain places runes in the walls and draws strange symbols. And he finds Alucard's childhood bedroom and the exact spot where Dracula was killed. Elsewhere, Alucard sits on one of the castle's ledges and notices children below, pointing and waving at him. He chuckles and leaps off the castle. He stops to hover just above the children and quietly says, Boo. They laugh and run. Then Greta commends Alucard for the good deed. Many of the children do not have any adults who pay attention to them. For a moment, Alucard did, and gave them a story they'll tell for the rest of their lives. In Targovishta, Saifa and Trevor continue their efforts to help rebuild the town, and Zamfir finally agrees to show them the underground court. There, they find villagers quietly passing the time, staring into space, or playing with royal antiques, treating them like trinkets. Among piles of gold, Trevor spots a one-of-a-kind weapon he recognizes from his mother's books, a two-sided dagger forged in India that can be spun to reveal up to two more blades, creating a full cross. Trevor asks Zamfir if they have all this stuff down here, why aren't they using it to help protect the villagers above them? She claims it's up to the king and queen, so Trevor decides it's time to meet them. Zamfir tries to stop him, but Trevor shoves her aside, then threatens the guards, and strolls through the curtain. Behind it, he finds two decaying corpses dressed in royal garb. Saifa joins them and quickly understands that Zamfir has kept the death of their leader as a secret. Saifa insists they need a priest so they can put the two royals to rest. However, after the catastrophe at Targovishta, all the priests were put to death. Zamfir insists they are rebuilding Targovishta and restoring its former glory. Trevor and Saifa point out that the citizens are starving in their own filth. Zamfir has done almost nothing to help them. Instead, Zamfir focuses her efforts on protecting two dead bodies. They will wake, Zamfir insists. Their majesties will awaken from the royal sleep and save us all. You're insane, Saifa says and Zamfir agrees. She trembles, remembering Dracula's fiery visit in their sky. How could you not lose your mind, seeing hell touch your home? Zamfir asks. Zamfir and Saifa continue their discussion while Trevor loses interest and digs for more items in the piles of gold. He spots one small cylindrical artifact and holds it, saying, Huh, well, no wonder they broke it into pieces. 
As Sypha tries talking sense into Zamfir, they are interrupted by a loud banging, followed by walls crumbling. Stones fall, and as smoke from the debris clears, they see Ratko leading a group of night creatures into their hideout. And theirs is not the only piece that is interrupted. Below a moonlit sky, an army of vampires and night creatures, following St. Germain and Varney's direction, march toward Alucard's castle. In Targovishta's underground court, the monsters begin to easily kill any nearby humans. Radko joins in the fun, killing several people until Belmont reaches him and grabs the sword. Nearby, Sypha defends the citizens with her magic, and while everyone else is embroiled in chaos, Varney searches for the court's transmission mirror. At Alucard's castle, the villagers dip their pikes and pitchforks in salt, then prepare to fight the approaching horde. The battle is evenly matched, but as each human dies, their soul is guided by St. Germain's runes in the castle, and collected as fuel for Dracula's resurrection. In Alucard's childhood home, St. Germain turns the key and begins opening the portal to hell. Meanwhile, Alucard leaps from the castle into the battle below, quickly dispatching many of the beasts with his longsword. Nearby, Greta does the same with her hammer, and as they fight, a steady stream of human souls float into the castle. Outside, a large beast grows larger as the vampires free it from magic shackles. Then, the elephant-sized monster blasts fire from its mouth, killing the archers in Alucard's castle. It charges again and bathes more of Alucard and Greta's troops in fire. They quickly retreat into the castle and close the doors behind them. Though the loud banging at the door reminds them, it's only a matter of time before the gate falls. At Greta's orders, the citizens begin fortifying the doors, while she and Alucard investigate the stream of floating souls. They follow it to Alucard's childhood room, where Saint Germain calmly asks that they stay back. He is using death magic, sacrificing the souls of Greta's people to open the infinite corridor to bring Dracula and Lisa back from hell. Alucard shouts and tries to stop him, but a magical shield prevents him from getting near. Saint Germain explains his plan, showing the ring on his finger that will bind him to Dracula and Lisa's rebus, allowing him to control it and the corridor. The sound of monsters banging at the door rings through the castle, and Greta pulls Alucard away from the madman so they can rejoin the fight downstairs. The doors burst open, and the army flows into the castle, followed by the large beast preparing to unleash its fiery breath again. However, Alucard throws his sword, and it flies into the monster, tearing its belly open from the inside. Under Targovishta, Saifa and at her behest, Zamfir, struggle to protect the people, while Trevor remains locked in battle with Rafka. He cuts Belmont several times, breaks his sword, and finally, Rafka stands over him while monsters pin Trevor to the ground. Before Rafka can strike him with a death blow, a civilian woman and her daughter distract him with a light shove. He stabs at the innocent woman and child, but his sword is stopped by Zamfir, throwing herself between the sword and her people. While his foe is distracted, Trevor uses the four-bladed weapon to free himself from the monster's grasp. Then, he stabs it into Rafka's heart, killing him. Behind them, Zamfir collapses to her knees, then whispers her last words to Sypha and Trevor. Finish it for me. Behind the curtain, and behind the royal corpses, Varney finds the large transmission mirror. He uses it to teleport into Alucard's castle, joining Saint Germain. The portal's light draws Sypha and Trevor's attention, and they find the mirror, with the mirror's location lock drifting, they leap into it before they miss their chance to follow Varney. At the castle, vampires and night creatures wreak havoc, while Alucard and Greta do their best to protect the people. In one of the halls, many beasts leap at Alucard all at once to overwhelm the exhausted vampire. He readies himself to fight until a pillar of flame and a familiar whip appear on either side of him. The monsters are vanquished, and Alucard smiles when he sees Trevor and Sypha standing beside him. He quickly apprises them of the situation, vampires and night creatures attacking refugees, and upstairs, a madman. The three friends ready their weapons and get to work. With Sypha and Trevor's help, the tide of the battle turns decidedly in favor of the humans, and within minutes, 
the first floor of the castle is cleared of any monsters. Unfortunately, while they are busy with the battle downstairs, the madman continues his work upstairs. Varney's vampires carry the Rebus into Alucard's childhood room. The Rebus, stitched together of male and female corpses, is laid on the carpet by the spot of Dracula's death, ready to accept the souls of the vampire and his wife. Varney hands St. Germain a note with the necessary forging phrases provided by Hector. Then, he notes that it's been a joy working with St. Germain from the start. So human, so easily led, he says, from the moment we met face to face. I don't believe we've ever met, St. Germain responds. Then, Varney transforms, revealing another of his forms, the alchemist woman St. Germain met in the Infinite Corridor. You know me, Varney continues, his voice growing lower and menacing. I've been with you for a while now, guiding you. You know me. We're old friends now. He transforms again into his true form, a large skeleton containing a twisting purple musculature. Its bones extend into an oval behind the monster, with several spikes growing from it, creating the illusion of a throne. Its skull appears almost human, except that its top half looks like a bony crown, completing the illusion of nightmarish royalty. It continues, I am death, and you people all took my treasure from me. Saint Germain stammers in shock, but death continues. Dracula was going to bring death to this world on a scale unimagined, something I could never do. I am a spirit, a function of the world. I can't raise armies. I can't fight an entire world teeming with life and bleed it to death. But he could, and that was taken away. I am not a vampire as you understand it. Death is my meat, and you people broke him, and I can't bring him back because I'm not human. Why is it that only human hands can reach into hell? Don't you think that's weirdly fucked up? I can't do it. Then Death points at Saint Germain and adds, But you could. Saint Germain tries to explain that Dracula will be in the Rebus and won't be the same man Death knew. But Death is undeterred, pointing out that Dracula will be trapped in the grotesque body with the screaming soul of his wife. They'll be driven mad by their bizarre existence, and Dracula's rage will bring murder on a scale never before seen. Death will feed and become the strongest creature on Earth. Then, with his bony fingers around Saint Germain's neck, promises to kill him unless he completes the process. Saint Germain opens the portal, just before Alucard, Sypha, and Trevor arrive, having vanquished the powerful vampires guarding him. Trapped behind the barrier, they watch as, with shaking hands, Saint Germain calls Dracula and Lisa's souls out of hell. The vampire and his wife fly through the portal, hugging each other, while Trevor repeatedly throws his morning star at the barrier, which appears to have some effect. While he works, Alucard's face is a visage of shock and disgust as the souls of his mother and father fly from the portal into the Rebus. Male and female shouts of horror can be heard as the Rebus flails around the room, grabbing its head, trying to understand what is happening. Finally, Trevor's whip breaks the barrier. In a moment of lucidity, Saint Germain looks at death and whispers to himself, What have I done? He quickly moves the portal next to the Rebus and yells for Belmont to make himself useful. Trevor runs toward the chaos, throws a container of holy water, followed by the four-bladed weapon. It spins sharply through the container and, now drenched in holy water, flies into the Rebus and slices the grotesque thing in half, freeing Dracula and Lisa's souls. The release of energy creates an explosion, taking down the roof and walls around them. One of Belmont's blades is inadvertently thrown into Saint Germain's torso. Barely alive, he stares into the portal. For a moment, he sees the silhouette of the one he loves. She turns from him and walks away before the portal closes. Enraged at the betrayal, Death grabs Saint Germain's key and swallows it, absorbing the many souls retained within it, before spitting the depleted key at a now immobile Saint Germain. Trevor wakes up in the remnants of Alucard's childhood room, with debris swirling around him in the portal's magical aftermath. He stares over the ledge at Sypha and Alucard, falling farther and farther away from him. I love you, Trevor shouts. 
Trevor, Sypha says sadly. I know. You'd better know, Trevor says. Just remember, Tref 4 is a terrible name. Then he turns to face death, made even more powerful by its recent meal. The elemental spirit's size eclipses that of a human, with just one of its hands now taller than Trevor himself. Belmont walks toward the monster and shouts, Oi, death! I want a word with you. He approaches the Grim Reaper, towering over him, and shouts again. It's time to give this place back to people who know how to build things. You and me, we're just killers out of history. It's time for us to go. And who's going to make me go? Death asks. You, with your bit of string in your hand? Probably not, Belmont answers. But let's just give this one last go, shall we? They fight as Belmont throws his Morningstar whip while leaping from one floating piece of debris to another. He dodges attacks as best he can, but each time Death's bony hand strikes Belmont, the blow is nearly lethal. After one such attack, Trevor struggles to stand back up, but while Death laughs at him, he does exactly that. With one arm uselessly hanging at his side, Trevor stands and brandishes his whip one last time. He swings it over and over, allowing magical flames to flow through it. Then, he strikes at Death's head again and again. He drops the whip and runs toward Death, while extracting from his pockets the magical components collected over the last few days. He holds a dagger between his teeth, so with his one working hand, he can place each gem where it belongs on the blade. The jewels glow brightly as Trevor wields the weapon and leaps at Death. Belmont flies through the energy around the monster, and it burns his right sleeve, severely scarring his still mobile arm. A half-dead Saint Germain witnesses the attack, and his finger moves as though attempting to cast one last spell. Finally, Trevor strikes Death's forehead with his magically imbued blade. The elemental spirit breaks to pieces, screams loudly, and explodes in a bright light. Illuminated by the being's dying energy, Belmont smiles as he and the light fade away. The shimmering energy around the castle seems to die down, and the debris falls. At Carmilla's castle, Hector and Lenore share a bottle of wine. He is blissful at the thought of bright futures ahead, while Lenore mourns her loss of purpose and direction. She explains that vampires live far longer than humans, and with so much time on Earth, all they seek is stability. They want things to remain the same. Carmilla was following this virtue, even though she took it too far. Lenore wanted strength, but as Hector points out, in the end, Carmilla wanted power. And now, Lenore sits in a cage under King Isaac's watchful eye. Frustrated by her prospects, Lenore throws her glass against the wall and shatters it. Then, she tells Hector that she will not stay in a cage, not even with him. I'm sorry for everything you went through, she says, and I'm sorry I can't be here to help you through whatever comes next, but I refuse to exist like this. She looks at the daylight through an open window and continues, and I want to see what's so special about the sun you keep talking about. Hector grabs her hand to stop her, but she assures him it's fine. It's what she wants to do. Then she asks what Hector will do, and he answers. He'll write a book so the future can know the mistakes they made. Lenore walks onto the balcony. She hears wind and birds. She sees the sun rise and turns to smile at Hector. Is that all there is to it? She asks. Hector, you are a silly man. She turns to Ash and her remains are carried away by a breeze. At Alucard's castle, the townsfolk collect debris and clean up from the post-battle mess. They organize things inside the castle and Belmont hold as well. Outside, Greta and Alucard talk. She asks what he thinks of her plan, and he responds that it was his plan. She clarifies that she cleverly presented the plan in a way to make him think it was his idea, then asks again if he agrees to the plan, to have the refugees stay at the castle, permanently. Ignoring for a moment that you are considerably more insane than I have previously estimated, are you sure it's a good idea? Alucard asks. I mean, I'm not used to people. They're used to you. Greta says, so just let them be used to you, and you'll get used to them. When Alucard still shows doubt, Greta points out she's seen him play with the orphaned kids, and she's heard how some of them call Alucard father. 
You, Alucard, are a very odd person, Greta says. I think I might like you. They smile, then notice Sypha is up. As Alucard stands, Greta grabs his hand and warns him to be gentle with her. She hasn't spoken to anyone in two weeks. As Alucard approaches, Sypha asks if he can spare a horse. She wants to rejoin her caravan as she and Trevor originally planned. She is pregnant and her people would be able to support her. Caught off guard, Alucard smiles and congratulates her. He loved me, Sypha says. We made a child. Something new and wonderful will have come from all this. I should go. Alucard's hand grabs hers. You should stay, he says. But she disagrees, saying she should be around people and not rely solely on him for help. And the child should have a community. It will, Alucard says, if you stay. I don't understand, Sypha says. Then Alucard tells her that the people from Dynasty will stay and form a new village around the castle in the hold. Greta joins them as she and Alucard tell Sypha more of their plans. They're going to build schools and create a better future for all of the children there. She's good, Sypha says. I know, Alucard responds. Sypha asks what they're going to call the village, and Alucard answers. I thought we might call it Belmont. In the distance, they notice a horse approaching with a robed figure on it. Sypha and Alucard run to the horse, and the exhausted man falls into her arms. Then the hood drops from his face, revealing the man to be Trevor, alive. Hello, love, he says. Tearfully, Sypha asks how, and Trevor guesses that St. Germain must have opened the infinite corridor for him at the last second. Death lit up like the sun, and Trevor was transported through the corridor to safety. Seeing Trevor's exhausted and beat up body, Sypha calls for help, but Trevor assures that he's fine, then asks about her. I'm fine, Sypha answers. Good, Trevor says, holding her hand. Then he adds that his biggest fear when facing death was that she might end up calling the kid Trevor after all. How did you even know? Sypha asks, wondering how he knew she was pregnant. Please, this is me, Trevor answers. How do you think I've managed to stay single and carefree all these years? Then she pushes him to the ground, revealing his badly burned scarred arm, and calls him a rude idiot, but tearfully adds that she loves him, before walking off. Alucard kneels beside Trevor and asks how he killed death. Trevor explains that in Targovista, fighters were hiding out in the royal family's treasure vault. Inside it, and around town, he ended up collecting the pieces of something a mad wizard blacksmith once made to enact a very one-sided murder-suicide pact with God. Alucard helps him up, and Trevor comments that the vampire looks weirdly happy. I, I weirdly am, Alucard replies, and adds that for the first time in his life, he doesn't know what happens next, but he has this feeling that it's going to be worth it. At the sight of smiles on Belmont's and Alucard's faces, and the townsfolk gathering to help Trevor, Sypha smiles and cries tears of joy. In a distant town, an innkeeper welcomes two visitors in from the rain, Lisa and Vlad Tepish. The two dry off in a small room lit by candle, hold hands and reflect on their recent experiences. I died, Lisa says, and you weren't there. I know, Dracula responds. And you died, Lisa continues. I did. And you came to find me, Lisa adds. Of course I did, Dracula says, gripping her hand lightly with both of his. Then she asks if he has any theories about what happened. But all he knows is that they woke up in a field. And as Lisa points out, they had to steal some clothes. She still feels bad about that and insists that tomorrow they will do something for the people they robbed. And we will, Dracula assures. After that, they can't return to the castle, agreeing Alucard deserves closure in his life. Though perhaps one day in the future, they will visit. Lying back on the bed, Dracula suggests they travel. Where to? Lisa asks. I was thinking about England, Vlad answers. There is a place on the northeast coast that is supposed to be beautiful. And they say the sun barely shines there. They hold each other and smile at the thought of their brand new future together. Thank you for watching this recap. 
If you'd like to hear my thoughts on the Castlevania series as a whole, check out my review by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And if you enjoyed this recap, please make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you're notified the next time we do a video. Thanks for watching, and see you on the next One Take.